This is the Self Storage Podcast, where we share the knowledge and skills from the industry's leading investors, developers, and operators to help you launch and grow your self storage business. I'm your host, Scott Myers, and over the past 16 years, we have acquired, developed, converted, and syndicated over 2 million square feet of self storage nationwide with the help of my incredible team at selfstorageinvesting.com, who has helped thousands of people achieve greatness in self storage. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Self Storage Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Myers, and I would like to take the time to introduce you to what will be known as our Platform for Change segments. My team and I have come up with the hashtag Platform for Change segments by inspiration of the hashtag Share the Mic Now campaign that took place in June of this year. And simply put, these segments came together by collaborating with my team members who are able to educate me, as I do millions in the self storage investing space, on understanding the lens of the black community and their everyday experience. Our own business that has grown through education, understanding, and partnership with a diverse array of wonderful individuals and these podcast segments will be a way to continue the conversations as our way of saying the lens and understanding need to become a shared experience in order to be the change we want to see. So today's guest, Harding Easley, spent two decades as an executive in telecommunications before choosing real estate and big data as a perfect combination for his next move. So in his role at Yardy Matrix, Harding advises prospects and clients on how to obtain up-to-the-minute data on multifamily, commercial, self-storage, and vacant land to come within 2% of final winning bids with less than 30 minutes of analysis per property. Harding will be leading today's episode to share his experience using big data to gather and analyze this data to make better investment decisions on your next acquisition or development. So without further ado, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Harding Easley. Hey, Harding, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's our pleasure. This is a, a long time coming. Obviously, um, Yardi is becoming a, a, a staple in the self-storage industry after several years of collecting data in the apartment side of the business as well. And, you know, we, you and I have done some business in the past and getting ready to do uh, more. And um, as we're looking at, you know, the landscape of self-storage right now and what's happening and data being so much more important than it ever was before, we just, uh, we're looking forward to this conversation and having you on. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to join you. Well, Harding, uh, if you would, I I gave everybody your bio before we begin here, but why don't you fill in the gaps by telling us how you got started in the storage business to begin with? Well, you know, it was by Yardy Matrix. Uh, We had become part of an acquisition. Pierce Iceland was the company that Yardy acquired. Um, And through that acquisition, multifamily and commercial were the two primary asset classes that were focused on. Uh, Subsequently, maybe about a year, year and a half later, there was a lot of traction in terms of self-storage. So we added that particular asset class to the uh, to the platform and it really went off well, especially with the REITs um, and because of our coverage being over 133 markets or so, um, pipeline information that includes development of over 2000 properties or more and the, the just robust data that we were able to provide, we began to make a mark really quick so my introduction started about three years ago as I began to uh, introduce myself to prospects in the self-storage investing community. I found it to be a real entrepreneurial type of uh, asset. And um, it, it's a little bit different feel than what I've got from my commercial um, and multifamily and student housing uh, type of clients. But uh, it was really down to earth mom and pop type of field, to be honest with you. Although I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we made great traction with the REITs. Um, you know, that was kind of where we had to target our efforts in the beginning, obviously, to get get the asset off the ground in terms of subscriptions. But uh, now it's 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 found its way through uh, to the mom and pops quite a bit and uh, enjoy enjoy speaking to self storage investing uh, you know, operators. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, uh, fr- from your standpoint, you've seen it from um, many different angles um, in terms of uh, Yardy Matrix and the, 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 the actual product and what it can do. Um, we've seen that as well. And I've been in the apartment side of the business in single family homes, but uh, tell it if you would, what is, you know, in, in your own eyes, and I know you're, you're, you're biased, but what, what is the biggest mm-hmm. benefit of, of data in general, but also what Yardy Matrix provides for the mom and pop investor that is going out and looking at and analyzing facilities? What do you, you know, what do you hear over and over again from your clients that say, oh my gosh, this is a godsend because of, you know, X, what does that look like? I would say, you know, I, I can maybe look at it like a three-legged stool. I mean, number one, finding opportunities. That's always the case when it comes to acquisitions. Where can I find good opportunities in the space that I'm looking to invest? Uh, I think we do a really good job in providing you with the overall details of when uh, transitional moments are happening. For example, being able to locate a property that has a loan that's about to expire. You know, 
they're at that trip, pivotal moment where they either have to refi or they have to sell. So that is a very key point in time that you want to proactively be engaged with someone that owns a loan. So being able to look up loans, expiration dates, that impending event that creates the go to, go to action uh, activity, um, that's available. Uh, comparables, things of that nature. So that when you make an offer, uh, you're looking at rents and you're looking at comps, you're able to make a solid offer. You have the due diligence necessary um, to, to make an informed decision on what you would like to offer for a property. And then thirdly, I think what's really, really valuable is being able to get a hold of the actual owners. Uh, you'll never find an LLC in the data that we have relative to self-storage uh, properties. So you'll always be able to contact uh, or reach out to a principal or a key uh, owner of the actual property. So that makes a big difference in terms of your deliverables and, and, and getting through the, the navigation of all the things that has to take place to acquire a property. So you can do a lot of preliminary work before you even reach out and call someone to make sure your time is worthwhile. So the way I, I typically sum it up is quite simply, we give you your time back. Uh, instead of doing all that due diligence that you typically would do yourself, your already matrix provides enough data that can give you your time back so that you can kind of really you can spend an hour looking for something and, and find out that's what you want to pursue uh, as opposed to weeks and days. Well, I'd say, um, you know, that, that's holding true more so now than uh, ever before as we begin to scale that um, how valuable your time is, because now when you look at the fact that, um, and again, we're, we're pretty, pretty small company, but um, as we're adding staff um, and we're getting not so nimble and, and now it becomes a, the, from a standpoint of, hey, do we, is this something that somebody on the existing staff can handle, needs to handle? Do we hire this out outside or do we bring on an extra head? And, you know, from what Yardi has been able to combine and allow us to do, as you mentioned, um, just getting to the owner, that piece, I mean, many times folks had to go out, you know, we'd have to search and search and search tax records, public records, and in some cases, um, you know, private detectives, not, not to really seek these people out, but only because they had access to being able to, you know, to pierce the veil of these LLCs if we really wanted to um, get to the owners and do skip tracing and, and pay for that. Whereas uh, now the tool, along with everything else that it does for analysis, um, not having to utilize uh, so many, um, it has just been, it has allowed us to save at the very least a half a person in our organization in, ter in terms of a salaried um, uh, individual to bring on. So, uh, so for that, I, I thank you. Um, so one of the other questions that, you know, that we had before that I wanted uh, our folks, um, and, and, and Harding, uh, this isn't, um, we didn't want to turn this into a commercial for Yardy Matrix, although it's, it's kind of hard not to because it's such a great tool, but uh, one of the questions that folks will talk about is, and we asked is, um, you know, the accuracy of the data, how, how wide reaching is it? Because, you know, many of these tools and resources, um, you know, the data that we get in the marketplace, you know, tends to be skewed towards, you know, data from the REITs and not necessarily from the smaller facilities to, to get the, you know, we always have to backtrack and to get into the real data and then the timeliness of it. So if you could, could you just, you know, kind of briefly touch on um, th those two areas, uh, you know, the timeliness of how often are you updating your database and, and scrubbing and getting good, good numbers in, and then how far reaching do you go down into smaller facilities, you know, to gather your sampling um, of the, the various data points that you use? Sure. Our uh, 25,000 square feet and above is kind of our wheel, wheelhouse in terms of the data coverage in 133 markets. So we're looking at those properties um, with over 600 researchers, uh, not only in the United States, but outside of the United States as well. We're coming through the data on a monthly basis. Um, there are other aspects of the business, such as pipelines, where we will take a 30, 60, 90 day check on things because things are obviously in the uh, different stages. For example, for properties under construction, we look at them in four different ways. We look at them as a prospective property where they've tied up a piece of land, perhaps completed some zoning information, requirement information, and we're beginning to track that property immediately. So whether it comes to fruition or not, whether there's money behind the project to continue its cycle, uh, we begin to track it. That's also very helpful for folks that need to touch uh, owners at that particular stage. Uh, maybe it's someone looking for a JV opportunity, uh, just tracking it. Now, you can also set up alerts so that these actually come to your mailbox. Second phase is um, the planning stage where now there's actually money behind a self-storage facility project and it looks like it's got legs. It's starting to um, pull permits and, and, and so forth and so on. And now it's into that stage and then it moves on through the cycle where we actually 
uh, put it under construction where we're actually, uh, you know, ready to go. And then of course, completion. So um, being able to track the stages under construction is really helpful for those acquiring properties because you now can see the actual supply demands that are coming around your particular acquisition target. So if in fact you're going to acquire an older property or a property that's currently existing and you may be looking to renovate or do some changes to it, you want to be cognizant of what properties are around it um, and what new shiny objects are near it uh, are about to be, be on the horizon. So those things are important to know and, and we provide that level of detail. And, and yet again, uh, you know, another um, caveat or another uh, option that, uh, that we found extremely useful because we would also then have to go to the zoning offices uh, to find out, you know, what permits are being pulled, who's you know, doing new construction and all, all the way, all right on through to a closing. We're in due diligence on an, an existing facility or some development. And you never know if someone, something's going to pop up. And, um, you know, many times it has. Um, we've seen some sites that have been sitting dormant that may have been owned by one of the REITs um, for years or even somebody else that had a, a name of self-storage in it, but it was a vacant land two and a half miles away and nothing was done. And then as soon as we were getting ready to buy a facility or do some development, then all of a sudden, guess what? Well, they started filing permits <laughs> and the, the, the race was on. So um, it, very, very helpful data yet again, uh, built uh, inside of Yardy Matrix to be able to um, you know, see that information real time in the marketplace before we get too far down the road and make a mistake and get under contract if it doesn't make sense to do so. So one, one of the other pieces as well that, um, that we saw recently was the fact that um, you were segmenting and pulling out uh, opportunity zones so that you could um, actually do a search based upon opportunity zones, which is, um, has, well, has been for several years, been very, very, you know, an important piece of the investing landscape for self-storage because we got a, an awful lot of folks coming out of 1031 putting into self-storage, but even more so now uh, where we have even small businesses that are able to pull some profits out and going into opportunity zone funds um, in addition to the traditional 1031. So um, maybe touch on that a little bit. How, how did that come about? And, and are there any other additions where you're looking to you know, add to the tool and, and really just from an investing standpoint, what, what is Yardy doing to make it easier for the searches and the data and the things that investors like ourselves uh, want to look for that may be coming down the pike that we're not aware of yet? Sure, that you know, Opportunity Zone is, is a great uh, place to start. I mean, I think about a year ago or so, as soon as that buzzword came out, everybody was jumping on, let's, let's you know, like anything else new in real estate, what's the new shiny object? Um, and, you know, the tax benefits that are related to it really bode well for the long haul investor, someone that's doing a long term investment and looking for the uh, those tax advantages that fall into an opportunity zone. So we immediately began to apply an overlay map to our coverage so that in the event that you wanted to look at that location um, that is relative to an opportunity zone, you simply check a box in your, in your query and they would put that overlay map on. Uh, even since then, we've also added additional map overlays that can also share uh, population um, medium income, uh, other things of that nature in a kind of a colorful way, if you will, of, of the map. So not only can you see that you're in an opportunity zone, you can kind of see the demographic surrounding that opportunity zone, um, which we found to be quite helpful. The beauty of Yardy Matrix as a subscriber is that it's an open architecture. So as we continuously improve the quality of the information and the data that is being provided to our subscribers, we're able to allow them to take advantage of that improvement without any additional costs. So when you subscribe January 1, we've had five, six, 10 updates. Those are not additional charges. If you probably recall back in the day when the, when things were a little bit different, every time you hear the, the term 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, there was also a cost <laughs> to upgrade uh, in various uh, uh, platforms relative to uh, cloud technology and so forth. But uh, we're a web-based platform and we're always looking to improve the service, not only from our own um, efforts, but also from our user community. Uh, we have a tab in, in our uh, portal that says report a problem. So if we don't get everything correct and we're, we're, we're pretty confident we're 95% of the time going to be accurate. But when we get it wrong, you know, our user community simply sends us something that says report a problem. Maybe the owner's name has changed. Maybe we just haven't posted it yet because it hasn't been um, you know, placed in, in, into, the, in, into the information at the courthouse, what have you, maybe we're lagging behind it. a few weeks of that being done, and therefore we'd have to do our trust but verify, but that's what we, exactly what we do. We'll take that information and then we'll apply it, 
do a trust but verify and then we'll change it. So our user community also helps with the quality. Um, and the way we bridge that gap is to have a good relationship, kind of like you and I have, Scott, where you can pick up the phone, contact our clients, or they can pick up the phone or even text me and say, hey, Harding, you know, that comp might be a little bit too, too low. You know, I just spoke to the actual owner. I know you guys made a little bit of an estimate on that one, but this is what I can definitively say. We do a trust, but we finally update the information. So it's, it's not uh, user driven, but it's definitely user enhanced. Um, mm -hmm. So we do have the resource and allocations of, of research analyst and, and, and so forth to make sure we have quality information all the time. Um, but the ability to, to grow with the advancements, whether it's opportunity zones or, or any other thing uh, that we see on the horizon, uh, sometimes we make special reports based on hurricane damage. Um, you know, we've done a ton, obviously, because of COVID-19. So we really stay with what's going on in, in the economy, what's going on in, in our nation, and try to make sure that we have uh, information that is very applicable to, to the investment concerns. Mm -hmm. Well, as we've looked at this and had discussions in our, in our mastermind and in our, our, with our higher level uh, groups that, that, that we meet with, you know, the comment has come up a, a few times. And, and I, need a, I need to qualify and quantify this for my consultants out there that may be uh, listening uh, in that, you know, Yardy Matrix, uh, not only backwards looking, but now um, forward looking reports as well, uh, that may be replacing a, a piece of a feasibility study for development or uh, a, an acquisition that has a component to it in which um, you, we are expanding. Um, are there more enhancements coming um, to Yardy Matrix that may look at, um, you know, giving more of a full blown report, perhaps similar to a feasibility study? I think there's no replacement um, for that, at least um, as of yet. But um, what does that look like and what might be in the works that we might be seeing uh, in the future with that regard? We are doing some narrative reports. It's on the roadmap uh, that we, we currently do with our multifamily uh, uh, asset whereby we can give you the, the metrics, whether it's employment, uh, supply, uh, rents, uh, occupancy, things of that nature. In our multifamily space, we provide a market point report and a sub-market point report. So you're able to actually look at a sub-market view of where your subject property or um, potential acquisition is. You can really understand who's developing properties, uh, what the rents are, uh, so forth and so on. So that's on the horizon. Uh, and should be coming out here in, within the next year or so, we'll be able to have those narrative reports available. Great pieces for an investment book so that it gives you a great overall view of what's going on in that market or sub-market relative to your asset type. Mm -hmm. so, so that being said, I'll um, maybe change gears, but looking at, at, at the landscape um, that we find ourselves in and at the, at the time of this podcast, it's being released uh, July. We are in a place where we're in a recession, uh, whether people want to ad admit or not, um, looks different than 2008 um, in, in many facets, as well as in the self-storage uh, industry, where we're still seeing um, strong numbers and strong performance in, in almost all areas, but some some sectors and perhaps rural and, and some of the smaller facilities are, are specific to a geographic location, they may be struggling or down 10 or 15 percent, but you know, from most of what we've seen across the board, you know, like all other recessions in the past, self-storage benefits as people downsize, businesses downsize, um, you know, we're in the trauma and transition business, as, uh, as uh, they say, and there's always a, a lot of trauma and transition, especially when the unemployment rate is at 40 percent. But um, if I could, um, I've been asking a, a few of my recent guests, um, Harding, that have been on, you know, give us your take, if you would, you know, get out your crystal ball. What does what the rest of 2020 look like for the investment side and the development side uh, of the industry from what you're seeing out there or even just from, from your tenure in the industry? You know, what are you seeing out there in the, in the self-storage landscape right now? You know, specific to self-storage, uh, I guess, a, 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 a cute cliche would be build, baby, build. I mean, I am not seeing a, um, a decrease in, in the development uh, supply uh, for uh, self-storage. Uh, they seem to continue building. Uh, there's been obviously in the last couple of months um, post the, the COVID-19, you know, there's been some modest decreases, but overall in, in, in the past few weeks, and if you want, you can refer to, you guys can find me on LinkedIn as well. Maybe look at one of the reports I just recently 
post it for self storage the national report from yardy matrix and feel free to go to yardymatrix.com and, and get that full blown report so it give you some real granular details but the outlook looks pretty good i mean it's one of the asset types that kind of sustains itself through something like this um, like multifamily it just has a, a great run um, but self-storage, if you think about it, is kind of unique. Uh, one of the things that I've always found unique about self-storage is that, you know, you know, the, the common everyday American household may have two cars parked outside of their garage. You know, you got two $30,000 assets parked outside in all weather conditions and all your junk in your garage. That tells me you need storage space. So there is a demand <laughs> uh, when, you, when you feel like you have to put your $30,000 vehicle outside to store stuff in your garage as opposed to using the garage for your vehicle. Um, that demand has probably increased somewhat, obviously, because of the employment issues, especially with the, the younger generation who are now deciding, hey, I don't have a problem living with a buddy or living with family. Again, let me you know, put my stuff in storage and go stay with mom, dad, in the basement for a while or buddy up with a, with a few folks and let's, um, you know, let's all get together. I was asking, it might have been my son, as a matter of fact, about one of his friends and how they were doing. And as, he goes, yeah, he moved. He's back over on campus and they're staying so and so and such and such. It's like, how many people? Six, like six people. Okay. <laughs> so obviously there's storage needs all the time, um, especially with folks trying to to, to look at resources from a different view now uh, with unemployment, like you said, being the way it is, folks are downsizing and looking for ways to save money. And when it comes to living expenses, the easiest thing to do is move in with friends and family and put your stuff in storage. So the demand, um, I, I think, will, will sustain itself um, or maybe even increase. But the long haul, I actually see um, self-storage, same thing is true with industrial. Uh, a lot of e-commerce, needing warehouses, um, those tend to be a little bit more resilient um, than, than than other assets. So I, I think the future is, is bright. Uh, like you said, you just got to kind of know where to place your bets. And that's where matrix could come in really handy. And um, I, I guess a little bit um, surprised. Um, we, we thought that the construction would... Um, and it did slow down a little bit and some projects, um, you know, have been put on um, hold and some uh, mothball, but not, not near the extent um, that I thought they would have been. And, and again, looking back to 2008, you know, that, that recession was caused by uh, the banking, you know, industry, you know, the financial institutions, you know, when Lehman Brothers went down, then all banking stopped for a while and, and, and the Fed stepped in. And so that was a little different cliff than we fell off this time. This one was caused by a disease and the banking um, side was still strong, lending side, but nevertheless, um, you know, they did, you know, the banks held their breath for a few weeks and weren't doing much of anything. And even then um, we still thought and rate, rates went up, LTVs um, went down and thought that this would kill some of the projects, but um, we, we only put one of ours on, on hold and the other five um, moved forward or we found different funding sources and, and it seems like other folks did the same uh, as well. So I, I think you're right, um, uh, build, baby build. I, I kind of hope that a few more, you know, for the, that we compete against um, perhaps <laughs> go on hold or pause, but we'll, we'll obviously keep an, an eye on those um, using uh, again, uh, your, your tool to help us with that. So, yeah, you know, indeed, we find ourselves um, here in, in 2020, you know, facing a, a pandemic, um, facing a, a recession in which, um, you know, we'll see how this plays out. But with, with those um, unemployment numbers could be one of the deepest we've experienced. But then add, add on to that, you know, the, the, the unbelievable um, issues and public witnesses um, on, on TV of race relations, if you want to call it that, completely falling apart in this country being torn and yeah. um, old wounds, um, you know, uh, band-aids pulled off and, and, and scars um, shown yet again. And so we're you know, doing our part and, and, and being very sincere and, and as cognizant as we possibly can, you know, continuing that conversation, which is the least that we can do. And so that's you know, one of the questions that I wanted to ask is, you know, as, as, as my eyes are being opened, as our eyes are being opened and the conversations we're having um, with our staff and, and with my kids, um, you know, as much as we think that this isn't the case, um, you know, racism is relevant and it's real and it's alive and it's um, probably more so alive than I ever would have um, either wanted to admit or had any idea about. And so um, 
with that being brought to light, um, just wanted to ask you some questions to see, you know, what, what does that look like? What has that looked like in, in your career? And is that something that you have witnessed personally or as you're um, going through uh, the corporate ranks and rising to where you are, um, how and has that affected you in your climb? You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I've often analyzed that. Um, everyone's experience is different. I would, I would be totally naive if, if I was to say that, you know, racism doesn't exist, uh, whether it's the, you know, the, the rise in, in corporate America um, or whether it's in, in, in investing access to capital, um, whatever practices that uh, pretty well have been documented in terms of the, the huge um, dispersing numbers that relate to, to, to the minority African-American, and it, I, I would re relate in my, in my case. Um, I think my, my overall experience, fortunately, is that I, you know, I was brought up in a very diverse community. Um, I think my high school was probably 60% um, black and 40% white. Um, but I often always was able to see the economic differences. Uh, for instance, we have 40 acres of farmland. I grew up on, we still, still have today, as a matter of fact, but we rented out to the farmers. We weren't the farmer, we rented out our land. So the folks that had access to capital, the folks that had access, access to land were not the minorities. Um, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, I could still go back to that community today and it's, it's a very impoverished community. Uh, I, I say that in, in, in also respect to um, the drive and ambition that an individual has and in his upbringing uh, bodes well for them to, to get out of any circumstance. Um, uh, I make no excuses for anything that I didn't accomplish in life, but at the same time, I don't make excuses for being held back because of things like racism. Um, it is going to be something that it's always probably going to rear its ugly head, either quietly or, or, or very vocally. I think some of the biggest challenges I experienced over time was relative to not seeing anyone else like me. It's not very easy for someone to go into an environment and we can always flip the flip the script on this and, and change it out. But imagine going to a, a, a black event, so to speak. It could be a business event. Um, a great one that I remember was uh, the Ford Minority Business Owners Convention once, which was all these minorities that owned Ford dealerships. Uh, great guests like Patti LaBelle was the spokesperson and so forth. Major um, companies such as Essence and Ebony Magazine were sponsors and it was such a different dynamic that I'm used to, to going to. All of a sudden there was tons of African Americans that were progressive and investing in, you know, obviously automobile dealerships and so forth and so on. And you saw the progress of economic empowerment that was relevant and it was robust and it was on fire. Um, and then you saw, you know, you know, obviously uh, other uh, races were at the event, but they were the minority. So things had switched. And I happened to be there with another colleague of mine at the time. We had a great time. He was white, I'm black. And obviously, you know, we had a great time, but it was so weird being on the majority side of things, as opposed to all the conferences that I typically attend, uh, where I very seldom find someone that looks like me. So you can be intimidated by the environment, I guess is the point that I'm getting at, or you can take it as an opportunity to showcase your talent, your ability, your knowledge, your skill set, to be prepared. Yes, we have to do more than the average person. Uh, yes, we have to go further than the average person. Um, but in the end, that all bodes well for everything and everyone. Um, anytime I have an interaction, I also have to recognize because I am a minority, I'm in a space where there aren't many of me. So I'm representing an entire ethnic class <laughs> um, because sometimes that experience can be positive or negative. Uh, and you will begin to stereotype or judge others accordingly. So I'm, I'm very aware of that mantle that I, I hold on myself whenever I appear in any format that is publicly uh, business-like and, and how I conduct myself can be perceived as representing my entire race for lack of a better way of saying it. And so I have to take that, take that to heart and, and, and uh, make sure that I'm doing the right things. But I say the biggest challenges I've had was just recognizing I'm the only one in the room. Um, and not to be intimidated by that. And, and I think I've used that to my advantage because unfortunately folks that think that myopic or, you know, that narrow tend to think that there's less of you to, to, to provide or to give or to provide substance or content. 
So they're totally astonished. I'll tell you a quick, a really quick one that I share with a lot of people. I was working in the telecommunications industry and I was probably in my thirties and I was very successful at that point, uh, moving into a national management uh, uh, position for sales for my division. And so the, another division of the company, you know, we kind of integrate our products and they were in Orlando and this was a great group of people in Orlando, but they were all probably like our current Congress, uh, you know, 50 year old, you know, <laughs> and they've heard my voice, they've seen my emails, but they never saw me. So this video conference call took place and I was sitting in downtown Phoenix in a nice, nice, nice view of the mountains and, and the downtown area and uh, the camera came on. So immediately, you know, they didn't see the camera come on. Everyone was looking down and kind of small talking. And then they looked up <laughs> and they saw my face. And it was just obvious. They just did not expect to see that face. And that was the moment, and again, I was in my 30s and moving up the corporate ladder of a, of a publicly traded company pretty well and doing a good job being recognized by the CEO and so forth. But it was really weird how the look on their face said it all. It's like, we never knew, we didn't know, you're young, you're black, you're wow, I didn't think you were that guy. It, it was just obvious. Uh, and uh, I always always remember that, uh, that you, you gotta continue surprising people, not just because of the color of your skin, but the content of what you bring to the company. And so for a moment, all those great thoughts they might have had or any positive thoughts they may have had about me uh, kind of froze. And then they had to realize, oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, he, he brought the content first. So why should I judge him now? So. That was a great experience for me to be in that company. But I will say this, um, uh, while we have systemic racism deeply uh, rooted in this country and the stain of slavery, uh, you know, going, dating back hundreds of years uh, and, and still apparent in some cases in, in, in other parts of the, of the world, it's, it's, it's very humbling to know that some of my most, um, I guess, greatest strides in terms of success have taken place because there has been uh, a white man, for instance, uh, that has really been a mentor to help me. So uh, I say that in the case of probably two individuals that I know personally, and I still keep in contact with today, even though I don't work with them on a daily basis. They took me under their, their wing and they, they showed me a lot of things and they gave me a lot of opportunity to grow and learn. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, not, to, not to say that, you know, I haven't been mentored you know, by African-American men or women as well, because I have, but I just think it's very important to know that we shouldn't paint everybody with a broad brush. Um, these folks are still actively engaged in my life, still always concerned about how me and my family are doing, vice versa, and we have great relationships. So I think where we are today is extremely important because this, this generation that, that's upon us right now, they mean business. They they are they are all about their voices being heard, and folks are going to wake up and realize this is this is not old school anymore. You know, one of the greatest things that I've been able to 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 think about in terms of even my own personal um, uh, legacy with my own family is you know with two grandkids and five kids, I have a really good length of time to kind of experience where they are in their life. So I would give this advice to any parent because we're all parents or individuals first and foremost, ask them for their playlist. It's a really good insight into where they are uh, and where they see the country and where they see themselves as individuals. Uh, I'm a firm believer that all human beings have the capacity to make sound decisions regarding their lives based on accurate information and, and an understanding of oneself. So oftentimes that playlist kind of gives me a, a deep dive into where they are in their lives right now. Uh, and and it's, it's amazing, you know, you, you go from, from heavy rap music to one day it's acid jazz. I'm like, wow, I remember when he was younger, it was, you know, rap music, now it's acid jazz. Oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, basically elevator music, but it's, it's, it's really, really, really important that we get to understand one another as individuals and we have a dialogue, an open conversation where we can hit these issues head on. Um, and and I, I think when we begin to do that as a country and as a nation, the next step is very, very obvious is policy. You have to change policy. I mean, we can be out protesting uh, peacefully, I may add, not ridiculously uh, protesting with riots and so forth. But you know, folks can be out protesting, being respectful to the process of freedom of speech, 
But if we don't change policy, uh, none of this really matters because uh, at the end of the day, we, we are a, a country that is ruled by laws and um, we must adhere to those and, and implement those and enforce those laws. So until we change policy, uh, a lot of things just don't happen. So voting obviously is uh, uh, obviously the first step in being able to be a force in terms of how to impact policy. And I don't know, maybe it was one of the uh, presidential candidates who said this out on their stump speech, but I guess her mom had said to her, um, you know, why are you always, you know, if you're going to complain, you know, why don't you do something to change it? And then she ran for president. So my, my point is not that everybody has to go run for president, but the, the idea is that um, having a voice can come in very different ways. I had a voice when I met someone at a convention who hadn't seen any African Americans in the old convention hall the entire week. But when I shook his hand, I shook his hand firmly. I looked him straight in his eye and I provided content that was meaningful to his life. I provided content that could help him benefit in terms of his investment decisions. All of a sudden, we have a common ground. And once we find our common ground, we begin, we begin to start a real relationship of being able to continue to serve one another with different skills and knowledge-based information that can be you know, helpful to each other. But then all of a sudden, we realize all of our blood is red and uh, we, need to get, we need to get over ourselves and our history and uh, look forward to the future. Well, Harding, um, you, I was going to ask you another question with regards to, yeah, what advice do you have to, to people that are facing uh, those challenges? Um, but um, you, you'd mentioned that and it's um, and how you not only conduct and handle yourself, but uh, what you're teaching your kids and, and your grandkids. And, and, um, and that is to be the change that we want to see and, and to do something about it. And, um, you know, certainly we, we, we have a long ways to go. And, uh, and again, my eyes have been opened um, and I had no idea how, how far away we were from that than I had uh, anticipated. And so um, for that, um, you know, we will continue to do our part by continuing the conversation. And so I, I appreciate you, um, you answering that question and, and shedding some light. Um, and, and once again, learning more, even more about um, the challenges in our in our country right now and, and still the divisiveness um, as it um, points to race. And, and we can only hope that in future generations, um, uh, I, I know it'll improve. I, I don't know that it'll get to the place where I'd like to see it before I take my last breath, but um, certainly hope we make a bigger strides. And as a result of uh, George Floyd's death, um, I think um, we're, we're going to make some huge strides at least I hope so. Um, you know, this is enough where people are saying this is enough um, to, to make that change. And for all the things you mentioned from policy change to um, starting in the home and, and just the way that we teach our children and, you know, this generational racism will continue if people continue to spew that hatred and, and say the things that they do and teach their kids um, that as they uh, pass that along. So with that, um, I'll get off uh, my stump, um, but only only to do um, our part from as much as we can on, on this side. But um, appreciate that, appreciate you. And um, once again, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing each other again in person. If we ever can get out to Vegas to uh, uh, an ISS or an SSA show um, um, uh, sometime soon, but appreciate all that you do for us and for our clients and, and for the industry and, and, and making uh, your product not only the best it can be from on the investing side, but just uh, once again, the way that you uh, conduct yourself and, and everybody over there at Yardy has uh, just been a pleasure to work with. So we appreciate you. Well, we, we appreciate you. And, and please, by no means whatsoever, minimize our conversation today. The mm -hmm. fact that you're willing to, um, you know, take this opportunity to use this platform as a forum to bring attention to something that we obviously see on a daily basis, uh, even if we don't want to, it's, it's on our, mm -hmm. it's in, in front of us on the TV screen or it's, it's on the radio or somewhere. Uh, we're reminded of it, and the fact that you are able to to take and use this as a as, as a platform to to share, you know, some conversation. I think bodes well for for the respect that you guys deserve in the industry. And I I, I love working with clients such as, as such as uh, self storage investing and. Uh, and uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be able to have this dialogue. Yeah, it's been my pleasure, Harding. So um, before we, we leave here, how do people get in touch with you? Do they catch you on social media? What's the best way to learn um, more about uh, what you do over at Yardy Matrix? But then uh, how do they reach out to you personally? Yeah, I, I would say feel free to uh, follow me on LinkedIn and send me a message. Uh, that's probably where I'm at the easiest. Uh, LinkedIn has become my text 
messaging <laughs> service, I believe. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's the best way. Or feel free to give me a call. You can reach me. Um, I'll give you my personal sale at 602 577 1804. Uh, also, harding.easley at yardymatrix.com or in my own private business, uh, H Easley at the harding, H A R D I N G, G R P.com. Awesome. All right. And uh, Harding, one last thing. Uh, any parting words of wisdom you have for our folks out there today that you would like to leave us with? Yeah, I, I would just like to say in the realm of uh, uh, two aspects. One, um, you know, determine what you're going to do in your investment, you know, strategy. Are mm -hmm. you in, you know, lockdown mode or are you on the hunt? Either way, mm -hmm. you may just can help you in either one of those scenarios. Um, and then secondly, in terms of where we are as a nation and, and the, the topic of uh, systemic racism in this country, um, be accountable to yourself. Ask yourself some deep questions um, as we continue to try to perfect our union. Uh, let's all remember uh, that we all adhere to a certain level of uh, common ground. And we talk about that pursuit of life, liberty, and, 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 and justice. And justice uh, belongs to everyone. We, we, we've had a, a real conversation about, uh, well, all lives matter. Black lives matter. Well, when you say all lives matter, Black lives are included. So if black lives aren't included, then all lives truly don't matter at this point. It means mm -hmm. that there's a segmented group of people that need to be targeted to have that same equal level of justice. And then once that's accomplished, then all lives will matter. Mm, that's good. That's good. No. Harding, thanks so much. I, I appreciate your transparency. I appreciate you coming in uh, teaching today and um, for all the value they brought to all our folks uh, today. And uh, I, my friend, I'm looking forward to seeing you again uh, very soon. So uh, with that, look forward to catching everyone on the flip side and Harding, you have an incredible day. We'll see you soon, buddy. You as well. Thanks. Appreciate you. All right. Take care. You too. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening as always. Now, we're going to be talking about topics like this that are on target for the times that we find ourselves in. So it is important that you are listening to this podcast every single week because the guests that I'm going to be bringing on and the topics we will be covering are relevant to what we are all going through right now. And it's just going to get better and better and better in terms of the content that we are going to be discussing. And it's going to be more timely than ever. So please make sure you subscribe to the show and make sure you're paying attention to these episodes as they are coming out during this period as I am specifically going out and finding guests who are providing really valuable information you need right now. So thank you so much. We'll see you next week.